The following program deals with a controversial subject. The theories expressed are not the only possible interpretation. Viewers are invited to make a judgment based on all available information. This is your captain speaking. We are beginning our descent into madness. <laughs> Open, open, open your, your, your mind. mind. And we're back to another edition of West of the Rockies. I'm Frank. Thank you guys for sticking around. I know it's late, but man, do we have a really, really exciting show lined up for everyone tonight. Genevieve, how are you doing on this Sunday evening? I'm doing very well and definitely looking forward to another great show. Totally. Tonight's episode, and I want to send a quick shout out to my good friend, uh, Ron Patton, who uh, helped us set this interview up. Big shout out to Ron and the crew out there of uh, Ground Zero Radio with Clyde Lewis. A uh, great bunch of guys. Uh, if all goes well, we'll be uh, seeing them again this year at uh, Contact in the Desert, which is just right around the corner. Yeah. Tonight's guest... And I'm just reading a little bit here about his bio on his website, which is uh, johnpotash.com. John has been actually interviewed in a lot of great programs, both in uh, TV and radio. He's also the author of this really interesting book. And, I, you know, I've seen this book in my timeline through social media. I think a few of um, my friends have read it by now. And... The cool thing is that he has released a documentary that accompanies this book. And the title is Drugs as Weapons Against Us, the CIA's Murderous Targeting of SDS, Panthers, Hendrix, Lenin, Cobain, Tupac, and other activists. This is a topic that I can't wait to get into because I think we're living in very interesting times. And watching this documentary made me realize that... Uh, the root of a lot of the problems may be this uh, drug war, if you will. So I'm going to bring our guest on the line. John, can you hear us okay? Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me on, Frank and Genevieve. Thank you for taking the time to be with us tonight. As I was saying, your, uh, your documentary hits on some very, very heavy points. Thanks. Let me ask you this. When did you begin to see a connection between the drugs that circulate the music scene and how it was being used to manipulate people, really. Yeah, I guess I started seeing that when I started working as a drug and alcohol counselor about a year or two after college. Yeah, this was 1989. And, uh, you know, I started hearing things from my clients, the people I was counseling about the government um, you know, dealing drugs and trafficking drugs. And uh, I saw going one a little bit in other places when I was working some other jobs, you know, like some other, doing some other part-time work before that. And um, so I started researching it more um, starting around 1990 or 91. And I was at a conference in 91 where I got to talk to uh, former U.S. Attorney General Ramsey Clark. And I, and I asked him, how do you how do you think the government uses drugs regarding society? And uh, he says, I think the, you know, the government uses drugs to sedate and divide the masses. And uh, so that, you know, those kinds of uh, invitations to this idea led me down the path to research it more, more seriously and uh, find the backing for the idea that eventually led me, you know, to write the book, Drugs as Weapons Against Us. And but I, of course, I took a, a sidetracked midway through the project because of the uh, targeting of Tupac Shakur and, and uh, different black leaders, Black Panther leaders, such as his parents and um, and other you know important black leaders. And so I wrote wrote the book, The FBI War on Tupac Shakur and Black Leaders, um, in two thousand seven, which I came out with in two thousand seven, and made a film based on that. And then finally came out with the uh, full project, you know, Drugs as Weapons Against Us. Now, one of the crazy things for me when I was watching the documentary is it's the history, how far back you were able to trace the roots of this drug war, if you will. And it's not really, just to be clear, I'm not trying to say that it's a, a war on drugs uh, when I say drug war. So why don't you give us a little bit of uh, history 101 
as far as how far back were you able to, like I said, trace the roots of this problem? I tried not to go too far back because I wasn't trying to write a full history book, but I just wanted to have people understand in the first chapter. So the first chapter goes from uh, basically uh, it really gets into it around the time of from the 1700s onwards. But um, I get into the fact that there was the British East India Company, which was shipping opium from the the India area, of course, that's why it's called the British West India Company. But um, it, this area along, you know, of India along the Himalayan mountain ranges, and um, because the, uh, for some reason uh, the areas around the Himalayan mountain ranges were the best places to grow poppies, and the best po- great, you know, the biggest and best poppy fields for producing heroin and you know opium and heroin, and so they're shipping tons of opium. Uh, and they're they're sending a lot of it to China, and I show the evidence that they they were doing that to to really sedate the population of China to to better take advantage of them. And the leaders of China realized that, and so they tried to ban opium. But the British fought two wars to force China to allow the opium in, and really took over China with those wars and took Hong Kong, took Taiwan, for example, and. Um, so uh, now some of the American families that were involved in that opium shipping became the most powerful families in the world, really. Uh, the Russells were some of them, and they started Yale University. The Greens started Princeton. Uh, the Cabots started Harvard. The Lowe's started Columbia University. And they intermarried with other wealthy families, such as the Pierponts of John Pierpont Morgan fame. And um, and the Rockefellers happened to graduate from Yale and be the benefactors of a lot of that um, money because they also started uh, private like, private clubs at each of these uh, you know Ivy League colleges such as Skull and Bones, of course I'm sure you've heard of at Yale, but also the Porcelain Club at Harvard, and uh, the people that graduated from uh, the Skull and Bones got the equivalent today's equivalent of two hundred thousand dollars upon graduation. And so with that, they got obviously a head head start in life. And so the Rockefellers graduated from there and they teamed up with the John Pierpont, with J.P. Morgan family and the Vanderbilts and the Carnegie's to form an oligarchy. And the Pier, you know, J.P. Morgan family and the Rockefeller family in particular bought up a lot of newspapers to then control, you know, our information and uh, gain control of a lot of our media, really about 95% of it, um, you know, through different means, you know, these different oligarchical families uh, now really do control about 95% of, of our information. And this comes from, you know, uh, loads of uh, different, you know, experts on this um, because, you know, even you know, Bernie Sanders and uh, another senator, a uh, female senator, I forget her name, uh, but announced this at, you know, at a press conference about, how you know, six multinational corporations now control about 95% of our information through their interlocking, interlocking boards of directors and all. And so um, that, that's some of the ways these oligarchs um, you know, gain control, you know, dominance in our society, and keep pushing the perpetual war. And in my you know, book and film, I show those wars are for a lot of resources, but two of the biggest resources are opium uh, and cocaine. And that's why our longest wars have been in Vietnam at one end of that Himalayan mountain range and Afghanistan, the other end of that Himalayan mountain range for the best poppy fields. You know, it's funny because you mentioned these prestigious schools and uh, recently news broke about some um, corruption scandals. Do you see them as being more geared towards and in favor of the more affluent, rich? Of course. Yeah, no, no doubt. Yeah, I mean, they're clearly in favor of the uh, oligarchical families and uh, the affluent. And, you know, their magazines prop them up um, and pretend like, you know, these are the the, uh, the smartest people in the world and you must listen to them and everything they say is true. When, you know, everyone, you know, people, anyone who's lived in a long enough time knows that that's just, you know, it's just a farce and that, uh, you know, the things they make up to you know try to get us to believe to keep them them in power 
such as our need for perpetual war or that all these drugs are supposedly good for us in different ways, you know, whether, whether they be, you know, the pharmaceutical drugs is a whole nother issue, but they, they pretend like these pharmaceutical drugs are the answer to all of our problems. But you know, these days they're pushing all kinds of street drugs as healthy medical, you know, drugs for us. And uh, there's um, think tanks, there's like foundations that do this. And they're a new form of, uh, of what they had in the old days, which was called the Human Ecology Fund, which was essentially a CIA front group, um, according to Anthropology Today, um, you know, and just many other sources that have analyzed this. But this all started with when the, uh, out, these top families pushed for the CIA to start after World War II with um, the National you know, Security Act of 1947, which basically made the CIA above the law. And then six years later, they started uh, Project MK Ultra, and Project MK Ultra's documents basically say, you know, this is the use of drugs as unconventional warfare. And they tested about three dozen different drugs on soldiers, on thousands of soldiers um, here in Maryland at Edgewood Arsenal. That you know, they used a thousand soldiers at one arsenal at Edgewood Arsenal alone here in Maryland, but thousands of soldiers in other areas too. And they found, they knew exactly how these drugs uh, would affect people. And they used, L LSD was one of the top drugs they used, but um, they used many drugs, of course, heroin and cocaine, um, MDA, which became MDMA, which is known as ecstasy or molly these days, um, and just many other drugs in, in this warfare. And I show the evidence that this warfare was not what we normally think of as warfare on, in foreign lands, on battlefields. But it was on anyone who dissented from their pro-war uh, racist agenda. And especially regarding the families um, that are funding or have definitely in the past funded these sort of um, enterprises, uh, to what extent do they really suppress the information? To what extent do they deny it? Well, it depends on what kind of information you're talking about. But regarding LSD, for example... I tried acid in my first year of college and just uh, tripped about a half a dozen times and uh, could tell that it was massively affecting. I, school was really easy for me when I first entered college, but after a half a dozen hits, things got really hard. And so I, I couldn't find any information telling me what acid was really doing that, that caused that change. Um, I looked for years and years. It took me going to the uh, Columbia uh, University Medical School Library to find uh, four studies that explicitly say that there appears to be some kind of mild cerebral damage happening with acid use. And uh, they can't clearly explain why, but they say that something is definitely happening. There's definitely some damage being done. So they basically suppress these kinds of studies. And so, you know, it's one study said we're not sure whether it's the acid itself or it's the strychnine, which is a common additive in LSD. Now, strychnine is rat poison. So, of course, that would make sense. That's causing some problems in our brains. But nonetheless, um, you know, these kinds of studies are hidden from us. Um, and you know, I had to look incredibly hard to find these studies. And so when you look at most books or most um, you know, mainstream uh, sources for this kind of information, they hide it. They pretend like, that acid's not a problem. But I've counseled loads of people over the last 30 years, and many, many people who have uh, taken acid agree that they think something's happened, something went wrong with, you know, with the, the acid hurt them a bit. So That's so interesting because what you do here in popular media, especially, you know, in these circles and fringe news and, you know, alternative uh, theories, People say that LSD is ridiculously mind-opening, it, it's a great thing, and that the government is actually suppressing the knowledge of how great it is. Where's the line between actually it's really bad for you and actually, you know, it could be good for you? Yeah, it's it's sad because, I mean, I used to think that way too in my first you know year or two of college. I definitely thought that way. And even after having the negative experiences, I had a hard time not thinking, associating LSD with 
you know, peace, love, and the 60s and all that. It's all positive. And uh, it really took a while to get out of my own denial about that, of what happened to me. But what I started to um, find was happening to the you know clients I was counseling. All I knew is that I wasn't going to try it again, but I had a hard time thinking it was automatically negative. And so um, what I found, though, is that they, they really um, end up controlling both mainstream media and they fund so much alternative media that it's, um, you know, the oligarchs end up controlling as much as they possibly can. So what we normally think of as alternative isn't really alternative when you look at the funding sources or some of the people that get into the, those organizations and, and just promote acid. And that's what it was with Timothy Leary. He, it turns out he had been admitted to an interview. They'd been working for the CIA since 1963. And all these uh, supposedly underground newspapers that popped up supporting you know, acid and promoting acid and promoting to turn on, tune in, drop out. And he means drop out of society and stop the activism. T loads of young people were getting into the anti-war movement and were fighting for civil rights. And he was saying that you, you all that are doing that, have, he called it, he said they had menopausal minds in their, you know, continuing to try to fight for these causes and not instead uh, search for spiritual growth, he called it. And so it's, um, you know, this is the way they, they, they fool us. And sometimes it's even reverse psychology. Like, oh, the government, you know, uh, doesn't want you to do it, so it must be good for you. You know, that's what a lot of anti-establishment, you know, young people that I've talked to, how they feel and that what they, the way they think about it. And they're being duped, sadly enough. Um, and so I, all I can say is that, um, you know, if you've tried it and you've uh, been testing your mind while you've been trying it, like in college or, you know, doing something else very rigorous with trying to, you know, work on things that are, um, you know, intense, you find that problems arise it's things get harder it gets harder to do things as well as you did when you know after eating acid for taking acid so um that'd be the hard way so i don't suggest that way but um talk to a lot of, a lot of people who have done acid and who haven't done acid and you'll start to realize that there's some really clear thinking minds sharp minds and there's some minds that are a little foggier that aren't as quite you know what william s burroughs says um, aren't as competent. He says he thinks acid makes people less competent. And uh, he's no prude, of course. He had a heroin addiction himself. But um, so, you know, Martin Lee, who wrote the book Acid Dreams, had also founded a group called Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, which was very anti war, very, um, you know, anti ra racism. And uh, he, um, he found when he interviewed a lot of these countercultural veterans and you know, leaders. He said a, a, a huge number of them, a surprising amount of them said they totally believed that the CIA was trafficking acid and, and trying to disseminate it into the anti-war movement to hurt their, their best, uh, you know, abilities. And, um, you know, so, and, and that's what he found. He basically found, and, and some other sources found, uh, that the CIA was the biggest trafficker in the world, actually, um, at least, you know, up until the 19, mid 1970s, when um, a guy named Ronald Stark, uh, who was part of the Brother Brotherhood of Eternal Love, was uh, arrested, and it, by Italian by Italian police, and uh, another investigator from England, it, it, you know, came across, was investigating his group, the Brotherhood of Eternal Love, and so Stark had acid laboratories on several continents, and uh, Dick Lee, a high level British investigator found that Stark, in only three years in Britain, had uh, had uh, basically sold about 100 million hits of acid. So when Stark went to trial, the, the judge in his trial in Italy was murdered, and then the next judge let him go, saying there's he showed numerous proofs to say that he had been working for U.S. intelligence since 1960. So we're going to let him go, and I'm sure it was out of fear, of course. But um, an Italian uh, parliamentary commission said that, yes, Stark was a U.S. intelligence agent for at least the last decade and a half. And um, so yeah. that's just some of the massive evidence of how the CIA was trying to disseminate it like, all over the world, but particularly in the anti-war movement, civil rights movement, to hurt our minds. Let me circle back to something you mentioned a little while ago, and that was Project MK Ultra, And I feel that if you had mentioned this, 
five, ten years ago, people will look at you like you're a bit crazy. But now mm -hmm. in pop culture, it has become like a, a, a household term due to shows like Stranger Things and similar uh, movies and, and shows. Can you tell us a little bit about the history of Project MK Ultra? It seems like it started back, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like it started back in uh, World War II Germany. Uh, Indeed, right. Can you tell us more about that, please? So, um, you know, Alan Dulles and uh, members of OSS, you know, the Dulles brothers, for example, were the, were the lawyers for the Rockefeller and J.P. Morgan interests. And, uh, of course, then you know, Alan Dulles becomes the longest acting CIA director. Um, and the other Dulles, John Foster Dulles, becomes uh, Secretary of State. But um, they were uh, paying scientists um, in England and with the, in Germany and you know, Switzerland. Basically, the founder of LSD, Albert Hoffman, was uh, getting money from these OSS interests. You know, this uh, Rockefeller and J.P. Morgan interest. And, you know, later when the CIA was founded, yeah, they, he was still getting he was getting money from the CIA. So he basically around World War Two, they're trying these psychedelics on um, concentration camp victims. So these, you know, German scientists are trying all these different psychedelics. They're just doing all kinds of experiments on, on these concentration camp victims. And so they then, you know, with uh, after World War Two, they saved thousands and thousands of these scientists um, with Project uh, Paperclip and then with another um, another operation called Sunshine. They sent uh, estimates range between 9,000 and 50,000, but they sent thousands of, you know, these uh, Nazi agents down to South America and um, in other parts of the world, actually, too. But so they had a lot of these uh, Nazi scientists in the CIA working on these psychedelic research with uh, projects called Bluebird and with other names, Artichoke. And then they kind of combined them all under Project MK Ultra. And these Nazi scientists basically just used, took their psychedelic research and put it into research here, you know, with MK Ultra in the United States. And MK Ultra had 149 sub projects. And so there's many different projects they were working on, but some of them were the ones I'm talking about with LSD and heroin and cocaine, et cetera, against the anti war movement and civil rights movement. It really blows my mind how, how this whole thing developed here in the US. When did the drugs arrive at these schools? Because it seems like that was kind of like fertile ground, if you will, for the tests that they were carrying out were they tests or were they already on a mission to like you said earlier divide and keep people in a haze and control them in that way well they started them out as you know studies because it's studies but yeah the evidence uh, suggests that they really were just trying to spread their use but they first paid um, the equivalent, today's equivalent of $150 to, to these students at about 45 different schools that this human ecology fund, this uh, CIA front group, what, you know, out, really based out of Cornell Medical School, um, they ran the human ecology fund, but all the money was coming from the CIA. Um, that money would then go into grants to these 45 different colleges to professors that would, would hold these studies, testing different psychedelics on uh, students that would you know accept 150 dollars to try the psychedelics, and these grants also went to about 40 to 50 hospitals around the country and uh, about 50 uh, prisons around the country. You know the most famous user of these grants was at Timothy Leary at Harvard, but a number of you know professors were doing this, and in Stanford, uh, over in Stanford University, they were doing it at the Stanford Hospital where uh, another famous uh, LSD user named Ken Kesey was a uh, writing student, writing graduate student at Stanford. And um, he, so he, he took the money, he was poor, and he took the money to try the, the psychedelic. He actually was uh, an alternate, supposedly an alternate Olympic wrestling team and had barely even gotten drunk before doing this experiment. Now on the East Coast with Leary, he ends up, uh, getting kicked out of Harvard after a few years, uh, two or three years of, of these experiments. And um, in, in to help him out comes the Mellon Hitchcock family. 
uh, William and Peggy Mellon Hitchcock. And the Mellon Hitchcock family owned Gough Oil. They owned the Mellon Bank. They uh, were they had several members of the, in the U.S. intelligence. And they proceed to fund uh, probably about a dozen different uh, sites for this Timothy Leary's new um, International Federation for Internal Freedom. He called it ridiculous name, but for psychedelic, you know, promotion. And so uh, Billy Mellon Hitchcock gives his uh, vast mansion on his 3,000 acre estate an hour north of New York City to you know, Leary to hold constant parties. He, he rents it to him for about $400 a month, which is peanuts for this gigantic place. But uh, so Leary holds constant parties there. The media focuses on him. And MK Ultra scientists set up base at this mansion. And as they lure um, civil rights, you know, uh, activists and artists and writers and musicians up from New York City, you know, a bunch of liberal folk who can promote this stuff, you know, when they say, oh, we had this wild time at this party with this great new drug. Uh, they go up there and all kinds of different um, psychedelics are tried on these these artists and writers and activists. And uh, and so and they make it one big party. So they're promoting it like crazy over there. And then on the West Coast, I show the evidence that the same thing was going on over there with Ken Kesey and his parties. So he gets a job after, you know, getting tested at the Stanford Hospital. They, they give him a job as a janitor there, give him the keys to the LSD supply and let him steal constant, you know, you know, large amounts of LSD to have constant parties over there. And as parties, uh, so a lot of military folks started coming to his parties and, uh, you know, and they talk about in my film, some of these people that were in the military before that, and they convince him to, to uh, paint a a bus in psychedelic colors in about 64, 65. And to take that bus on an interesting route, they were only supposed to be going to New York for something, but instead they go all through the civil rights South with this bus promoting LSD to where there was these other buses carrying these freedom riders who were going there to support Martha King and, and voting rights for blacks and different other you know rights for blacks. And they end up in, in uh, going to a, a New York event, but they first go through Harlem where the uh, biggest race riots or, you know, activists call them race rebellions had occurred in 1964 or five when it happened, when they went through there and they, they come back to um, the San Francisco Bay area and start the acid test, which is, you know, bigger and bigger parties with the grateful dead as the house band. And uh, they, they end up having trash cans full of, L of Kool-Aid spiked with LSD. And some people knew, you know, knew it was spiked, and some people didn't. But they proceeded to hold the acid tests all around San Francisco, where there was the Berkeley Free Speech Movement happening at that time, like the, the biggest activist movement on, on a campus at that time. Um, and a lot of those activists were also supporting civil rights, the Civil Rights South, coming, you know, supporting the Freedom Summer rides. But um, so then they take the parties also down to Los Angeles uh, right after the Watts race riots. And they, um, you know, and they get them all tripping, you know, on, on these, this acid from the Kool-Aid, which was heavily dosed and was, you know, really hurting people's minds. Now, we know, you know, the best evidence that this was all MKUltra was the fact that uh, there was a legal deposition done by the, the top MKUltra psychologist, a guy named John Gittinger. And he admitted in his legal deposition that him and two other MKUltra scientists were at uh, a number of these acid test parties. So, and, you know, and they even said there was two others and Keltra agents at, at one or two of these parties. So what were they doing there? Obviously this was all and Keltra, you know, experiments pretending to be grassroots parties, pretending to be a grassroots phenomenon, but, but inadvertent, you know, but promoting LSD to the, uh, to activist youth and people of color. A lot of these, um, agendas and, I guess, stories you hear about in past tense. Really, it wasn't that long ago. So how many of these projects, experiments, I guess, are contemporaneous? How much do you think is still going on right now? MK Ultra officially uh, was closed down by John F. Kennedy, but the uh, assistant CIA, so, and he also fired the, the, the director of the CIA, but the assistant director kept, kept running the experiments behind his back. And so they just changed the name to MK Search. 
And uh, the best researchers, you know, I've seen one, you know, about the subject say, even when they were called again in the mid 70s with when the uh, U.S. Senate Church Committee um, investigated them and, and the uh, director, Richard Helms, CIA director Richard Helms, shredded uh, really about 300,000 documents, they, is estimated, were shredded. But uh, 30,000 uh, weren't found that were duplicates in the financial department. And that's what, what we still we have as evidence for, for these experiments. But um, even so, even after that happened, uh, it was found there's loads of evidence that continued uh, for decades thereafter. So it, best evidence is that it continues till today. It's still going on. And so there's three foundations that are replicating uh, the Human Ecology Fund and have serious connections to the Human Ecology Fund, admitted connections even. But um, one of them is called the MAPS, or the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies, and others called the Hefter Institute, and a final one is called the Beckley Foundation. That's a British one. But uh, they're funding studies with massive amounts of money. They're getting money uh, donated to them by the Rockefellers, and they're um, they're just promote their their goal is to promote psychedelic drugs. I mean, they even say it in their websites. And um, so they're funding studies all over the world. And there's such power and influence that uh, you know, in, in some of these top medical schools, they they just want the money and they they you know love having the money there. That they uh, they follow through and they they take on taking the money and following through in the experiments. And mainstream newspapers report these experiments. But, um, you know, they're all influenced by the powers that be, sadly enough, to promote psychedelics to hurt our minds. It's like the new Soma, if you ever read Brave New World. That was, it's the equivalent of, um, you know, the old school Matrix uh, in terms of uh, the concept is the same. Yeah, I, I, um, I saw one of those Matrix movies, but I, I can't say I remember it that well. But yeah, I, I, that's what I think's going on. Yeah, they're just trying to keep us... Uh, you know, dreaming and fantasizing with these psychedelics, but but hurting our minds while they have perpetual war going on, and that that was basically the plot of Brave New World, and that's because Alice Huxley's family was British elite, and he knew some of this stuff, but um, and uh, and I think I think he meant well, but was manipulated in the end of his life to um, you know, just die tripping basically, but he he uh, I think he had better aspirations than that, and he was really for some good stuff. Yeah, no, absolutely. It really makes you question whether, you know, living um, a superficially happy life is is better than living the true life and knowing what's really going on. Yeah, I rather, rather all, my, all my senses working at, at their natural best and uh, really, you know, trying to you know, have fun in natural ways while at the same time fighting uh, for peace and not perpetual war, you know. Yeah, and... You know, on that note, I, I was wondering, do, do you see, um, at least, you know, personally, the correlation between what's been going on in terms of um, the drug war over the last, say, 100, 150 years and the rise in, you know, depression and other mental illnesses? Yeah, I, I think there probably is because, I mean, the other, um, you know, they also just try to... Um, push the fact that depression is normal and anxiety. I mean, that, that people it's, you know, that people get in these clinical depressions and people get into have clinical anxiety. And really, I think it's a, it's a lot more trauma based than they're, they're willing to let on. But, um, yeah, no, I do think that drugs, uh, often are traumatizing our brains. And as much as I, I had a drug problem when I was in high school and I, I weaned off in college, thank thankfully. But um, I do think it, it does, you know, these, yeah, a lot of this drug taking can traumatize our brain in small ways. And it, you know, it takes sobering up for a while to really get us in, in the best condition. And ecstasy uh, is known. I mean, scientific studies show that it does things to our serotonin levels that really does can cause you know, more long term depression. But I think none of these drugs can cause problems in that regard and you know alcohol is a depressant of course and so yeah i think i think there could be uh some correlation between the you know the massive drug use and some you know me mental health issues sure yeah now uh 
before I go back into the the sixties and what was happening in the U.S., I want to ask uh, you know, and I apologize, I'm not. Um, uh, hopefully, I'm not taking you too far away from the main topic. It's just something that occurred to me as as we were sitting here uh, talking. One of the things that I remember reading about, as far as like the project MK Ultra during you know the 60s and the 70s, some people believe that it also has to do with the rise of abduction experiences. Uh, in that time, and I I know I've read a couple of accounts, at least, of people that believe that their alien encounter was sent aliens after all, but it was some type of military project where they were uh, drugged, basically, and were subject to these experiences to see how they reacted. The, in your research, I know you don't cover it in, in the documentary, but in your research, did you come across any type of information that would point to that type of operation going on i did i did come across a little bit of that but i'm sorry to say that i don't remember it well enough to comment on except to say that like the way you described it is the way i I read it too um but i just don't know enough about it to to elaborate on i'm sorry to say all good now as we were talking about what was happening here at home in the 1960s my next question is obviously the rock and roll world had its biggest contributions by artists in in the UK. When did the CIA and I, if it's okay to use the CIA as kind of like the umbrella term here, um, yeah. when did the CIA began their experiments, if you will, in the UK? Because it seems like a lot of musicians, prominent musicians, musicians that changed the course of music history, if you will, seem to have dabbled in this drug yeah i I talk about how in 1965 robert lashbrook the uh, assistant uh, deputy director basically of um mk ultra went over to as the beginning of 65 he goes over to london with loads of lsd and agents and money and he instructs his agents to put um acid in as many musicians hands as possible and a few months later, John Lennon and George Harrison are having a dinner with George Harrison's dentist, and they're with their 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 wives or girlfriends at the time, and um, and so George Harrison's dentist uh, proceeds to dose Harrison and and Lennon, you know, through their coffee, and you know John Lennon was furious, and George Harrison said LSD I never heard of before, and so. You know, then they they get other agents and other people to influence John Lennon and George Harrison to try it again about a year later in uh, in Los Angeles at a party with David Crosby, uh, pretty close to the you know on the right on the edge of the Laurel Canyon area, where there was a number of operations going on. But um, so that that was one of the ways they did that is they just uh, they, now they I argue that they also yeah CIA should be kind of an umbrella term because it is a lot of U.S. intelligence that was working on this, but also uh, British intelligence, MI6, the Tavistock Institute, et cetera, was working on this at the same time. And and, and probably other, um, you know, intelligence, you know, groups in other countries, but British and, and the U.S. were really leading this drive. And then, you know, uh, Mick Jagger got his first hit of acid from an undercover FBI agent, according to the Daily Mail. A uh, newspaper which uh, said this David Schneiderman was working for both uh, FBI and MI5, which is British FBI, and convinced uh, Jagger to try LSD for the first time. Then and then, police came and arrested them, and they now had you know certain Rolling Stones under their thumb. And so this is some of the way it worked. Then you know at the same time, uh, Jimi Hendrix got biggest. He you know, got really big in Britain before he got big in the United States, and I think that was probably because of a lot of American racism, but he, he got really big, really fast in Britain, and uh, into his life, a guy named uh, Mike Jeffries asserts, asserts himself into Jimi Hendrix's life as his manager, saying he had all these connections to help with his concerts and stuff, and Jeffrey, it turns out, was MI6 previously, he says he left MI6. But all the best evidence shows that he was continuing to work for MI6 undercover. And at first, he, you know, he got 
Hendrix some concerts, but then he started doing things to really sabotage Jimi Hendrix and uh, keep him under his control. Uh, Jimi Hendrix's uh, fiance Monica Damon wrote a memoir about the fact that uh, Jeffrey um, planted drugs on him at an airport. Jimmy Jimmy said uh, to get him arrested, and uh, then then he um, gave him you know put a ton of uh, psychedelics in his drink to hurt his guitar playing when he tried to do an anti-war benefit. And Jeffrey constantly tried to sabotage any efforts. Jimi Hendrix tried to do uh, with anti-war benefits. and But uh, when Martha King died, Jimi Hendrix got much more political and started talk, uh, dedicating his album to the Black Panthers and talking about them in interviews. And so um, he was kept trying to get, get away from uh, Mike Jeffrey. And finally, uh, he fires Mike Jeffrey, and within 48 hours, Jimi Hendrix is dead. And so two people in Jimi Hendrix's life later revealed that uh mike jeffrey when he was drunk had said that he, had, he admitted that he had Jimi hendrix killed and so who can do that you know who can uh within 48 hours of being fired just have someone killed so fast but someone with you know very powerful connections of course so um but he, all of Jimi hendrix's life they didn't show what Mon monica Daniman said that he was totally getting away from any kind of heavy drugs and just smoking weed every now and then, having a drink every now and then. Uh, did he stop doing psychedelics? He only he only tried heroin once or twice. He didn't do any other heavy drugs. But they painted him as a as a you know dying of choking on his own vomit after heroin use, or they you know, pretended like he was you know he loved psychedelics and and you know did them all his life and wrote his best songs on psychedelics. And so they pro tried to use him to promote drugs. And then when he was sobering up and getting more into the activism, they did him in. And that was the pattern that really played out with most of these musicians. Not all of them, but most of them. And, um, you know, and so you can see that with John Lennon. You can see that with Kurt Cobain. And to a bit with Tupac Shakur, too, you know, to different degrees. I mean, Tupac was born an activist, but um for the rest of them that's just basically the way it played out that's the thing that i i found really interesting about hendrix and his story and all of this is how he he was used and it seems like yeah the moment he tried to get away he was uh discarded if i may use the term now yeah. uh one of the things that at least geographically one of the places that became like the epicenter for the this hippie movement that came about in the 60s and it was really well documented in in the amazing book by Dave McCowan, uh, mm -hmm. Strange Tales Inside the Canyon. And, and you know, I always say this every time we bring up the subject because that was one of the in interviews we sadly missed because we were in talks with Dave to be on the show and he was already pretty ill and, and passed away, you know, before we, we ever got a chance. And, you know, it's one of those things that I always kind of regret a bit never getting a chance to ask him about his book but you also cover and you reference really as well dave mccallan's work tell me a little bit about laurel canyon and i know that there's some movie studio in those in, in that canyon uh that also plays a very critical role in all of this that we're talking about um can you walk us through a little bit of that so i do have dave uh speaking in my film and um because I mean, I happened to be talking to him just um, just before he got diagnosed with that cancer. I was just, you know, uh, emailing back and forth with him, comparing notes on publishers, and um, he uh, it was very sad to me that we we talked about uh, trading books and stuff. And so it was very sad to me when he got so ill so quickly. And um, but so I think I think his weird scenes inside the canyon. Yeah, it was uh, very. You know, fascinating book, and I think he did great, great research with that book. And uh, but I think even his book before that, Program to Kill, is even better writing than than uh, you know Weird Scenes Inside the Canyon. But um, you know, they're both fascinating books. I think he's a great writer, a great researcher. So um, Laurel Canyon has had a movie studio called Lookout Mountain Movie Studio, which uh, Dave described as the uh, largest, most like self-contained movie studio with a vast amount of employees. And it was owned by the Air Force. 
And so all these employees had to sign confidentiality agreements and it contracted to uh, like a number of the biggest directors and actors of its time. And it, it supposedly closed down in 69, though uh, a number of people say it, it actually went longer than that into the 70s. And the best research really says that, well, you know, even if it closed down, it, it just moved to another location. But it, it supposedly put out 19,000 classified films. And so here it is in a small area of Los Angeles, Laurel Canyon. And also in that area, uh, loads of musicians just all gravitated to that one neighborhood and then proceeded to become virtually instant rock stars. So it's, it's a bizarre phenomenon. But, you know, he researched and found that most of those top mus musicians, most of those instant rock stars came from either, I mean, virtually all of them came from either uh, top military families or right out of the military or, um, you know, the wealthiest families in the country or both. And David Crosby was one of those examples. He came from, uh, you know, both military and, and super wealthy family, uh, the Van Cortland family. And I used to live in New York, and people who live in New York know about uh, in Cortland Park Parkway. It's named after this family. So people like Crosby, uh, Frank Zappa's family was out of Edgewood. You know, he grew up in Edgewood Arsenal. His father was a chemical warfare scientist, and uh, Jim Morrison's father um, was head of the Gulf, the kind of uh, ship that caused the Gulf of Tonkin incident that started the Vietnam War. And so just a number of these musicians all had these connections. And some of them were really people like Crosby and Zappa and a uh, guy from I think Phillips, John Phillips from the Mamas, Mamas and the Papas, were really more of the ringleaders of, of these parties they would hold in this canyon, in this canyon neighborhood where they would have tons of uh, other musicians come in and they'd have these groupies that were um supposedly runaways but um so one of these groupies you know wrote with the, the band she was like a teenage uh runaway who was involved in these sex and drug parties constant sex and drug parties in the early to, to mid 50s uh, you know until the late 60s i mean i'm sorry early to mid 60s and, and even you know up until till the um, early 70s i would say but uh, it would introduce loads of people that would come to these parties to to new all kinds of new drugs and uh you know associating and they'd have these you know sex orgies and all that and as much as it could have been just hedonistic fun you know the fact that they all became these instant rock stars is just uh suggests that there was more to it that they were just trying to to turn a lot of people onto drugs through these parties and um you know and, and I, I argue that's what you know the way they got john lennon and, and george harrison to trip again and Ringo Starr had tripped for the first time. And I, I argue other musicians, you know, would probably get introduced to, to acid and other drugs at these parties. Going back, you know, to, I guess, not really mainstream um, theories, but definitely at least the standard fringe ones we hear about. How black and white is it when it comes to these drugs? Because my first thought, and, you know, before really researching this um my first thought was it, it was the equivalent of let's say you have um a kid you know high school kid and they don't have a great attendance at school and and they get suspended and they don't go to school so a lot of these whether it's rock stars or any any other type of artist how much did they help them in terms of you know creating their music creating their outlook on life, um, and how much did they damage them? Yeah, I, I would argue that it was more damage than help. I mean, I think a lot of these musicians, uh, you know, were really creative artists in the first place. Well, now, when I say the musicians that I'm talking about are the ones I talk about in my, in my um, book and film, which are, um, you know, Kurt Cobain, John Lennon, Jimmy... Hendrix, Tupac Shakur, the Rolling Stones, uh, people like that, you know, Elvis, actually, Eminem, people like that. I think they were all very intelligent, very creative people. And I think they would have, and, you know, Janis Joplin, they just were very gifted 
gifted uh, artist who would have uh, been, you know, were already uh, doing great music or could have done great music without the drugs. And I don't, I, you know, I argue that the drugs didn't help them and actually hurt them. Now, you could say in, in a few instances, if someone, you know, uh, wrote a great song while on her- heroin, glorifying heroin, okay, maybe that one song was made better when they were uh, high, you know, high on heroin. Uh, but, you know, of course, the heroin really ruined their lives. You know, they had to go chasing it every day or they throw up, and that's, that's what a heroin addiction is about. You know, and so it's really uh, for any kind of short term benefit, it was like, like a lot of long term harm was done to these people with the drugs. Yeah. And and, so the real targets of them really were the activists. The Students for Democratic Society were seriously hurt by these drugs. The Black Panthers were hurt by these drugs because um, they targeted Black Panther leaders such as Huey Newton and the Fanny Shakur. And uh, they got them, they got undercover agents to show the evidence, they got undercover agents very close to them and got them, you, you got Huey Newton using cocaine. And he, you know, I've got Bobby Seal, his co-founder of the National Black Panther Party, saying that, you know, why are you using this? You know, why he told Huey, why are you using this cocaine? But it was undercover agents that influenced him to use it. And then he developed a problem with it, and he ended up uh, really tearing apart the party because of uh, that influence of all these undercover agents and and the cocaine. I know we have to go to break in a minute, but I, okay. I can, I mean, this is not even a theory. Most people think that it, it's really reflected in what's still happening nowadays. And there are so many substances, so many drugs being pushed on people. And I'm not just talking about illegal substances. You know, there's plenty of legal ones that, really are not viewed as that great and yet they're advertised all over television and on the radio i totally agree yeah i mean there's so many mk ultra spawn so many different drugs and yes legal and illegal drugs and uh yeah i think they're they there's problems with the number of them i mean i think there's some good medications don't get me wrong i'm in the mental health field and i think some mental health medications help people but there's also some some bad ones, and there's some ones that are causing problems with people. And and of course, there's loads of illegal street drugs. And I argue that they that most of them, virtually all of them, uh, came out of Project MK Ultra, sadly enough. And but some of them, you know, some of the medications, of course, were were good. You know, they're someone's uh, suicidally depressed. It's great that there's a good antidepressant that helps them. But um, there's so many benzodiazepines and other drugs like that that are they're causing problems with people. And and um, so, yeah, there's, there's definitely some problematic uh, pharmaceuticals and street drugs, of course. John, if you'd be so kind to just hang on the line while we take our top of the hour break, we're just going to play a couple of songs and run some station IDs. And then I really want to get back into, yeah, some of the, uh, the uh, effects that this had on the uh, social movements of the 60s and 70s because as we'll soon see the effects we're still feeling them <laughs> to this day so is it all right if uh, if you sure. just hang on the line and then we'll get sure. right back into it sure i'm just gonna get some water and uh i'll be back back with you in a few minutes awesome thank you so much john and thank you to everybody that's tuning in right now on the TuneIn app uh live me we had a little uh technical snafu there but i think that the uh, live me feed has been restored so big shout out to everybody that's tuning in through that and if you're catching this as a podcasted version of the show hello to you uh good sir and or madam we hope you're doing well we're gonna take a quick break right now we're gonna go out actually this song was a request by genevieve genevieve do you want to tell me why did you uh choose this next track because it's a great song and a great remix thereof. That That's all there is to that's it. That's about all you need. <laughs> so this is the Fugees with Ready or Not, the champion bootleg remix. This is West of the Rockies, WOTRradio.com on the Independent FM. Genevieve's here. I'm here. Our guest, John Potash, is here. And we're going to be right back. Enjoy this one, guys. Here we go.
And we're back to the second hour west of the Rockies. I'm Frank. Thank you guys for singing around. I know it's uh, it's late, but man, do we have a really cool show here going on right now. A little bit of back announcing. You just heard some GNR, some Guns N' Roses. One of my favorite songs, Garden of Eden, off of their 1991 double album, Use Your Illusions. Considering the topic we're covering tonight, just the title of that album, um, yeah, is making me think. Uh, before that, we had the Fugees with Ready or Not with a really, I'll be honest, I had never heard that version of Ready or Not. That was the Champion Bootleg Remix, and uh, it, that was pretty fun. Oh, no, I'm, I've been really, in the last few years, getting into remixes of things. And, you know, back in the day, it, it was a B-side. It was like, oh, you know, version 200 of this song. And now they've, they've got some pretty cool remixes that will turn any song into something you didn't expect. Yeah, totally. And uh, really quick, I just want to let everybody know that uh, as always, I'm Engineer Frank on Twitter, West of the Rockies on Facebook. Don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at WOTR Radio. Also subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash WOTR Radio and the website if you want to take a guess what it is. Yep, that's it. WOTR Radio and you just add dot .com at the end of that. Oh As no, <laughs> repeat that. I, I didn't quite get that. WOTR Radio dot com. Uh, so always I'm joined by Genevieve. Uh, catch her here every Thursday night, 7 to 9 p.m. Pacific time, hosting her very own show, No Added Flavors, Music, Fun Facts, Jokes, and a whole lot more. Our guest tonight is Mr. John Potash. And I want to bring him back on the line because uh, John... Where can people find your documentary and your book and learn more about you? Yeah, so the, uh, the film Drugs as Weapons Against Us, the CIA War on Musicians and Activists, is now streaming on Amazon Prime and Vudu and Vimeo and iTunes and uh, places like that. Um, you can also buy it at places like Barnes & Noble and Amazon and Best Buy and Target and Walmart. But uh, I... You know, I don't think many many of them have it in stock. I mean, I know there's one Barnes & Noble near me that had it on the shelves, but most of them just have it. You have to buy it online from them. Uh, but so, yeah, that's where you can see the film and the book. The book, you can, uh, if it's on the shelves of Barnes & Noble, they'll, they'll, um, you can order it and they'll get it on the shelves in two or three days. And, of course, it's sold on Amazon and other places too. Very cool. And let me ask you this. Have you... Uh, have you been approached by uh, anybody in the music industry or, uh, you know, people that might be privy to this stuff that uh, have corroborated or maybe even disagreed with some of the information you put in your book? Uh, well, I, I, Mo Prem Shakur, Tupac's stepbrother, uh, agreed with my work a lot. And uh, so he contributed to the, the film, you know, and so, you know, I've talked to other people that... Um, you know, basically agreed. I, I can't say I've had too many people talk to me and disagree from any, you know, that were that knew any of these musicians. Uh, most of the people that, that I've, you know, had any kind of um, you know, um, communication with tend, tend to agree with it. And just to kind of uh, bring us back to the conversation, let me ask you this. It's fair to say, considering everything we discussed in the first hour, that the hippie movement was basically engineered by the CIA, again, using the term CIA as an umbrella term here, but am right. I correct in that assessment? It appears so. I mean, you know, you can't say for sure, but it does appear that way. Yes, both through the Laurel Canyon scene, the San Francisco scene, and uh, some scenes in St. Mark's. I mean, some of these uh, people like Herman Kahn of the, the, I think he was of the Rand Institute, but of these social, you know, these conservative think tanks even boasted about how they created these wastelands in these different urban areas, you know, between San Francisco's Haight Ashbury area and St. Mark's, you know, place in that area and, you know, Alphabet City area of uh, New York City, Lower East Side. Um, so, yes, it seems that they, 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 have, they have engineered this, they have cultivated this, yes. Let's talk about the impact it had in, in society, not just through the uh, musical movement of the time, 
But one of the things that I've I've always felt, and you know, I'm I I wasn't around for it, and I'm just going by what I've read and and discussed with other people. But the '60s was a very turbulent time, and we lost some very influential people that I believe that if they were, if they would have been allowed to uh, still be here, the society perhaps would be in a better place. I want to believe, but yeah. it was in the '60s that. Uh, John F. Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, Malcolm X, uh, Martin Luther King, they were all murdered and taken away from us in a very abrupt way and in a very brutal way. Tell us how these deaths, how could they, these people have been victims of this drug war? Yeah, well, in my first book, The FBI War on Tupac Shakur and Black Leaders, I go into serious detail about Martha King and Malcolm X's assassinations. But in my second book, I, I, I don't go to it in as much detail, but I do talk about them a bit to say that, um, and there's a film based on my first book also, but in my second book, I, I don't go into as much detail. I do, do talk about how all four of the you know 60s icons that were assassinated, JFK, RFK, MLK, and Malcolm X, all the Vietnam War. Um, you know, JFK in his last year or so changed his mind about the Vietnam War and announced he was going to pull troops out of Vietnam. And uh, the Vietnam War, as I said before, was the location, it was the golden triangle for poppy fields, one of the two best places in the world for, for poppy fields that, you know, produce her opium and heroin. So, I, I show that that was one major reason that they assassinated JFK and RFK and Malcolm X and Martha King. Um, now, Martha King was assassinated exactly one year after he announced, officially announced um, that he was uh, you know, opposing the Vietnam War. On the exact year anniversary, he was assassinated. And um, I show that that was no coincidence. And he, one of his top the top researchers for you know a friend of his named William Pepper who became who became an attorney later, uh, you know wrote the best books on his assassination orders to kill and an active state, and you know and found that the, the government did assassinate you know his friend MLK, but um, with uh, Malcolm X held some of the first protests against the Vietnam War, and RFK clearly came out against the Vietnam War. And but RFK and JFK had also gone after some the top mafia bosses, uh, particularly Marcello Carlos Marcello, who was in charge of trafficking cocaine from Central American regions into the United States, and you know was heavily involved in different you know in trafficking different drugs. But they went after a number of mafia bosses that were also involved in in trafficking drugs. And that was also a problem, you know, for RFK and JFK. But, you know, further, as I said earlier, JFK had closed down uh, Project MKUltra, and RFK was in the administration, too, that closed down Project MKUltra. So um, these were some of the, you know, relations to drugs that, for the reasons I argue that they uh, assassinated RFK and JFK and Malcolm X and, and MLK. Now, of course, there was other reasons also, but I, I just say these were unexplored reasons that they, they killed them. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I almost feel like it was also very strategic because, you know, it really destabilized the country. And for many, many years after that, it just was never the same. Now, when we look at a movement that arose around the same time, and that was the Black Panther movement, you know, they were basically a result of the racial tensions of the time. How are the Black Panther or the Black Panther Party, how are they involved in all of this? How did they become affected by what was going on? Well, they were basically fighting for socialist programs, uh, basically just they, they were anti-war for sure. They were fighting for civil rights. They were fighting against police brutality. And for free breakfast programs for, you know, young black kids, for free medical programs for the black community and the poor, especially the um, lower income black community, fighting for housing rights and, uh, you know, considered themselves socialists. And uh, so they were a threat to the oligarchs, the powers that be. So, of course, they 
you know, the oligarchs use their police intelligence to, to target the Black Panther leaders, and they killed about 25 different Black Panther leaders around the country. But they also, um, I show the evidence that they use drugs to undermine some of these top black leaders, and particularly the co-founder, Huey Newton, with cocaine. And they used uh, several undercover agents. They, they surrounded him by undercover agents that influenced him to, to use cocaine. Um, one of them, it came out with a, a book, you know, revealing himself as, as working for the, both the CIA and the FBI his name was Earl Anthony. He wrote a book called Spitting in the Wind that reveals that. And uh, the other one, uh, his cohort was a woman named Elaine Brown, who never did come out with her, you know, her agent status. But best evidence supports that she was. And Geronimo Pratt, who was the Los Angeles Black Panther leader, and Kathleen Cleaver, who was the national spokesperson for the Black Panther Party, both came out with the fact that they believe she was an undercover agent. And uh, show loads of evidence that she was, and a number of Black Panther leaders, you know, have said this, including and Bobby Seale said, and many Black Panthers have told him they believe she was an undercover agent, and he says that you know she did get him, uh, Huey Newton, doing things to to break up the Black Panther Party nationally. So I show all the evidence that the similar thing happened to uh, Fanny Shakur. She was a one-time leader of the Harlem Black Panthers. Brilliant you know, young lady who um, just uh, defended herself in court and helped get all the Black Panther Twenty One off in court, um, and then she was she was having to be pregnant with Tupac while she was in court, and they gave birth to him just after uh, getting out of jail. But um, she was lecturing around the country at, at schools, colleges around the country, and uh, she was kind of um, you know attacked in terms of not being able to get work after that. And then when she was uh, hurting for money, um, into her life comes a guy named Lake Saunders, who was an assistant to Nikki Barnes, who in turn was an assistant to Frank Matthews, I believe his name was, who um, was found when he went to court, it was found that uh, nine of his associates were let off of their case because of their connections to the CIA, because they were all, you know, connected to the CIA, according to court documents. And so... This is uh, some of the way it worked. They, you know, the CIA set up these these kind of networks, and in that network of, of cocaine dealers, uh, they would also use that that person for other things, such as you know, you know intelligence operations. So Lake Saunders, uh, Feeney said, proceeded to put a crack pipe in her mouth every time she came home from uh, her daily you know activist work, and uh, got her hooked on crack cocaine. And that is something that we ended up seeing really become a, a major problem here in the 80s with the uh, what became known as the uh, crap epidemic. Um, that wasn't something that just naturally happened, it sounds like. It seems like that was also planned and engineered so that things would go down in that way, correct? Sure. And, you know, when I told you earlier about the, the Project Paperclip and and uh, Operation Sunshine, those uh, CIA operations basically saved, you know, thousands of Nazis. And when I said they sent them, you know, down to South and Central America, uh, those Nazis said had colonies, German colonies in, in, these, in a number of these countries. And they cultivated um, partnerships with what, what became cocaine lords and helped the CIA set up the trafficking of cocaine from that region into the United States eventually. But they also led cocaine coups. Like uh, they led a cocaine, uh, Klaus Barbie, who was called the Butcher of Lyon for his murder of, um, you know, people in France, you know, particularly Jews, of course, in the concentration camps. Um, he had, had his own colony. He was a couple with his cocaine lord and, and was like led this coup in Bolivia in 1980, they called it a cocaine coup. And there was a photograph of actually a Nazi flag uh, in the, you know, on a mountaintop in the Andes. And, um, and this happened in a few different countries with the, you know, Nazis behind a lot of this stuff. So um, an operate a uh, project called Condor uh, was an official assistance operation and connection operation of all of the of that nine different uh, Latin American countries 
with U.S. intelligence help, uh, supporting coups in these different countries. So the most, one of the most famous ones being the coup of Salvador Allende, the socialist doctor who won the presidency of, um, of Chile. And when they toppled him and put in the U.S.-supported dictator, Augusto Pinochet, they proceeded to murder, you know, tens of thousands of, of leftists. And they did the same thing in, in all the other Project Condor countries, you know, where I started, it's called Operation Condor Countries. And they even went and chased down leftists in, in the United States that came into the United States and in other in European countries and, and killed them, you know, even in Washington, D.C., setting up a car bomb. So that's what was going on down there. But they were aiding the uh, cocaine trafficking routes from that area into the United States. And it became more famous when it, it was started going on around the uh, Nicaraguan you know, coup that happened with the Sandinistas toppling this U.S.-supported dictatorship there of the Somoza family. And uh, then the U.S. supporting a group called the Contras to try then overthrow the Sandinistas. And the Contras were... You know, Gary Webb, the fam famous journalist around that case, called them basically a uh, CIA army trying to topple the Sandinistas. And um, he found that they were trafficking cocaine into the United States and uh, then doing it through a guy named Freeway Ricky Ross and uh, getting cocaine and crack and ch you know, cheaply into communities, particularly black communities around the country. And so it turns out that Free Wiki Ross had two assistants. And one of those two assistants was a guy named Michael Harry O'Harris. And it just so happened that he started a record label called Death Row Records. And um, it turns out um, that that record label had dozens of police officers at all levels. And according to a um, white police officer named Russell Poole, who, who investigated them, and when he when Russell Poole asked his superiors what what are all his fellow police officers doing there, his superiors said you can call them troubleshooters or covert agents. So uh, sadly enough, Death Row Records appeared to be a, actually a U.S. intelligence front company, and they lured great artists like Dr. Dre to to work for them. But then when Dr. Dre was uh, so messed up about what was going on in there, he left them with nothing even though he was a creative force behind them. Uh, Snoop Dogg, same thing. He, he just he saw what was going on in there, and he tried to leave, and he was really chased out and was scared for his life. Um, but Tupac didn't make it out alive, sadly enough, because he was lured into Death Row Records, and then they, they really basically were trying to, to kill him because their mission was to traffic drugs and traffic guns and oppose what Tupac was trying to do, which was Tupac was an activist from birth and, you know, being born to the Black Panthers family. And he was head of the New African Panthers at the age of 17 or 18 years old. And um, they were active in about eight to 10 cities around the country. And so he was already a black leader before he became a rapper. So with the FBI's counterintelligence program that targeted MLK and Malcolm X and the Black Panthers, um, they were, it, it actually continued, according to uh, COINTELPRO whistleblowers. And um, I showed them, of course, my film, and have them speak in my film. Wes Swearing talks in my film. He was a COINTELPRO agent, as, as do CIA whistleblowers, such as John Stockwell and Phil AG and people like that, that, that reveal a lot of this information, I'm telling you now. But um, with Tupac, he then took on a new plan, which was to pretend to be a gangster in order to appeal to gangs and politicize them. And as part of his uh, Black Panther extended family's plan to get uh, truces between the Bloods and Crips and uh, to turn them into activism and to get them to stop drug dealing. And it was becoming very successful, spreading throughout the country. So he was threatening billions of dollars of the CIA drug traffickers, as well as billions of dollars of the uh, money launders of the banks and the multinational corporations that were money laundering. And so the uh, CIA really wanted to get rid of him for that reason. It's really crazy because I was definitely around for that time period. And I do remember all of a sudden this rise in what became known as the East Coast, West Coast beef. And it's funny because watching your documentary, that kind of made sense because as, as you said earlier in the show, 
one of the things that they wanted to do was to divide and basically the divide and conquer technique. And it seems that's yeah. exactly what was happening here. You had Tupac who was trying to broker these uh, treaties and truces among the, these two big gangs. And uh, here comes the CIA and uh, basically sabotages this whole operation, correct? Yeah, and they, you know, they, of course they killed Tupac. They pretended like, uh, so Suge Knight and others spread the word that oh, it was the Crips that killed Tupac. And they uh, gave t loads of guns to the, to the Bloods to kill Crips. And a gang war, after the peace truce, the gang war started again. But um, after Tupac died, he was, you know, in the hospital for about seven days or so. But after he died, enough activists spread the word that they didn't think that the Crips killed Tupac, that the war that got reignited stopped. And that's what Death Row was trying to do. Actually, inside Death Row Records studios was he hired Crips and Bloods and tried to get them fighting between each other. It was, it was unbelievable, you know, to points that there was actually shootings and murders at Death Row concerts between Bloods and Crips. It, it really blows my mind. Really quick before I move on, in the case of the notorious B.I.G., Christopher Wallace, was he an unfortunate casualty of this? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, he was. He was kind of a collateral damage to to uh, throw the scent off of uh, Death Row's police officers killing Tupac. They killed Biggie to make it look like it was part of the East Coast West Coast rap war that really killed them both. But the best evidence is, is that these police officers actually, you know, police intelligence, killed them both. But killed Biggie to hide the uh, you know evidence that they really you know they killed Tupac, who was the real target. And the thing is that the fact that nobody has been arrested in connection to these murders and found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt uh, lets you know that whoever planned this, whoever carried this out definitely knew what they were doing and they knew how to go about it without having it come back to them. And the question then is who has that type of power, right? Right. And there's three, you know, movie companies, movie studios tried to make film, a film about Russell Poole and all he did with his investigation. He first Sylvester Stallone was going to play uh, Russell Poole. And then that movie movie uh, announced, you know, they announced the movie. It was supposed to happen, and it got squashed. And then uh, Leonardo DiCaprio was supposed to play Russell Poole, and DreamWorks had it all laid out. And it was all going, you know, into it was all happening. And it was going to come out, and then it got squashed by the LAPD. And then finally, um, Johnny Depp, just within the past year or two, was supposed to play Russell Poole. And I even saw the movie was done. I saw the preview in my movie theater in Baltimore. And uh, within just a few weeks before it was supposed to come out, you know, they canned it. They weren't allowed to, re to get released. Wow. So that's the power of these people, you know, the, of U.S. intelligence to be able to do this. That's really mind-blowing. Let's talk about another contemporary of Tupac, Kurt Cobain. And mm -hmm. he was extremely influential for a, an entire generation. And for the longest time, I went with the explanation that he was a troubled individual and he mm -hmm. took his own life. However, in the subsequent years, uh, a man by the name of Tom Grant came out with some very incredible allegations of what he believes happened. How much credibility do you lend to Tom Grant and his research? And how does Kurt Cobain fit into all of this? Yeah, well, I think Grant did good investigative work. He was originally hired by Courtney Love, actually, to to supposedly find uh, Kurt Cobain a few days before he died. And uh, he ends up realizing, you know, after uh, some investigation that, that Courtney Love actually knew where Kurt Cobain was. She, he was calling her regularly because he wanted to, you know, know how their daughter Frances was and one, didn't want to lose touch with Courtney because of that. But he, you know, he, he basically taped uh, most of the people he talked to, including um, Kurt Cobain's lawyer and Courtney Love's lawyer and uh, Rosemary Carroll and had people like her and other people saying on tape that they believe that Kurt was not suicidal and he didn't kill himself. And the uh, supposed suicide letter was actually his, his handwriting copied onto that letter and that those, that handwriting kind of practice of you know, trying to copy Cobain's writing was found in Courtney Love's backpack that she left at Rosemary Carroll's house. And uh, Kurt Cobain was divorcing Courtney Love at that time and was asked Carol to take her out of his will. And 
Courtney Love had asked Carol to find her, the most vicious divorce lawyer you know, possible. And so that's what was going on at that time. But the, uh, the bigger picture really is, is that he fit the pattern of these other musicians. Of they were manipulated to use you know, drugs more at first and inadvertently promote it. Um, and then when they started sobering up and getting more into activism, they were done away with. And so what I found with Kurt Cobain is, um, well, basically I started with the fact that John Stockwell, a CIA whistleblower I mentioned earlier, had said in the um, in an interview in the late 1980s that that uh, CIA planes had turned to the Golden Crescent for producing opium in the Afghanistan area and were now running operations where they were flying loads of heroin out of Afghanistan to the United States, just like they'd been doing in Vietnam. And he says that, um, you know, so there was loads more of heroin than ever before coming into the United States. So they had all of the supply coming in and they had to make demand match supply. And how they do that, they resort to what they had done in the 60s in trying to get these musicians to promote it inadvertently. So I argue that they psychologically profiled the musicians that were rising up in the United States and they found that Kurt Cobain would be the best musician to target because he had a massive stomach problem. In his own journals, he had, he had you know, disclosed uh, trying heroin about a half dozen times in four years just to try to quell his, his really painful uh, stomach issue. So in 1991, Nevermind is meteorically rising up the charts, the music billboard charts, and into his life comes, you know, Courtney Love introduces him, herself at a party that she's at with Billy Corgan. She leaves Billy Corgan, latches on to Cobain. They start dating. She gets pregnant immediately. And uh, everyone close to them said that that was the first time Kurt Cobain started using heroin daily was with Courtney Love and that she used it to manipulate him. You know, he'd never done heroin regularly before that. And so then he, he develops that problem. He inadvertently promotes heroin. And then uh, at least a year before his death, he says in an interview that, of course, you saw in the film that I have in the film where he says he found a, finally found a medication to solve a stomach problem. And uh, I argue that he had, he had started getting sober by that time. Um, but a month before his death, we know he was sober because they did a blood test on him when he was in Rome. And he went into that coma, and the only thing they found in his blood, they found no illicit drugs whatsoever in his system except for Courtney Love's sleeping pills, which she had gotten prescribed in London, where it's legal to prescribe rohypnol, which is also known as roofies. And, of course, roofies is that blackout drug where you don't remember anything that happened. And uh, so he almost died then. It could be argued that that was an attempt on his life right there um, with the roofies she, she most likely put into his drink. But it showed that he wasn't a heroin addict at that point and a month before his death. But then when he dies, you find a massive amount of heroin in his system. So I have the you know uh, head president, former president of the American Academy of Forensic Science, Cyril Wecht, say that um, there was you know, enough heroin to kill at least three severe addicts in Kurt Cobain's system. And so he said for Channel 9 News that um, he believes Cobain was murdered and was made to look like a suicide. So that's some of the evidence that, um, you know, it was a higher level intelligence operation. But I can give you more, of course. And, you know, I'm wondering, and I, I know that, you know, while on topic, let's use uh, Kurt Cobain as an example. He, along others, were incredibly influential. They... They would think outside the box, but what yeah. was so, what was really the crux of it in terms of how would they benefit by getting rid of him and what would he have achieved if they hadn't? Well, he was very uh, left wing, very anti war, very anti materialist, very, uh, you know, anti racism, um, you know pro-women's rights and uh, pro-abortion rights, etc. And so, you know, I argue that, like, the band, the rest of the band, when he died, the rest of the members of the band played a benefit for the battle, you know, against Seattle kind of march, the uh, anti-globalist, um, anti, um, I don't know if you remember the march on Seattle, 
where um, it was arguing against the um, kind of exported jobs. It was arguing against things like NAFTA and the uh, trade agreements that were exporting jobs to other countries and where companies were moving to other countries and stuff. But um, he would have played at those kinds of things with the ban and would have attracted huge amounts of people at, you know, to events like that. Um, he, you know, he, it is, uh, he said that he was thinking about putting on the cover of his album, Nevermind, all sorts of anarchist essays that, you know, describe how to build your own bomb and things like that. We thought he'd better wait till he's more popular, you know, and then people would take it more seriously. So this came out in a biography of him, actually a year before he died, that he was planned to do that. So that was a, that was a worry to the powers that be. Since at that time when that biography came out, he was already, you know, arguably the most popular guy in the world, an influential guy in the world. So um, that's some of the wor worries about him, you know, as a uh, political figure. Yeah. And I know we're, we're almost out of time, so I'm going to try to get through my last two questions here as fast as I can so you have uh, ample time to answer them. But I'm one of those people that I, after a while, I feel like coincidences don't really happen a whole lot. As many people know, there's this thing called the 27 Club, right? And yeah. everyone from like Brian Jones, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, Jim Morrison, they all passed away at the tender age, really, of 27. And Kurt Cobain, are these all coincidences? I mean, a lot of people have tried to find some kind of significance in the number 27. Are we reaching by uh, even going down that path? What is your take on all this? Because these are all figures that pop up uh, throughout your uh, documentary. Yeah, well, I I, um, I don't address that, but I do. You know, a lot of people have asked me this question, like yourself, and um, I do show evidence that the, the U.S. intelligence did use anniversary timing tactics, like I said they did with MLK earlier. You know, the exact year anniversary of him announcing he's against the Vietnam War. And they did it a number a uh, few times in Tupac's life. They did it with uh, some other uh, high level police, you know, uh, political targets of US intelligence. They used um, these anniversary timing tactics. And um, so I do believe that it's certainly possible that they could have used the age of 27 as a kind of subconscious um, warning, you know, that uh, if you, you know, a lot of these musicians happen to get political by the age of 27 and um and then they're they're you know they die mysteriously janice joplin started getting very political the last year of her life you know Jimi hendrix did um and so I, brian jones started to do the same he actually had gotten Jimi hendrix and john lennon to agree to form a super group before uh he was murdered Brian Jones, they say he drowned in his own swimming pool, but friends actually saw him get drowned by people. So um, I think that, uh, yes, it could be a, uh, a tactic of U.S. intelligence as like some kind of subconscious warning. If you act like these musicians and you, you know, um, start to try to sober up and you try to do anything positive, this is w what could happen to you. Yeah, I think you totally nailed it in the head because what I was thinking that, yeah, it, it must be some kind of subliminal subconscious way yeah. of letting you know, yeah, not to step out of line. Well, I was wondering in terms of contemporary stars, who do you think, if not most people, who do you think um, has been a major target recently? And I know, you, you know, there's a lot of talks about the stars that came out of the Disney Club, I think that's what it was called, Mickey Mouse Club? Yeah, the Mickey Mouse Club. Yeah. yeah, and uh, I mean, you have Ariana Grande nowadays. Before that, we had Britney Spears. Are they all on the same agenda? Well, I, I don't know. I just, I do know I, I counseled someone who was a Disney, national Disney dancer, and she was repeatedly raped by her um dance coach when she was young you know teenage young teenager and it really messed up her mind um and you know when you when you get raped at a really young age uh, between the ages of three and eight years old it can cause you to become dissociative and in its most extreme you can develop dissociative identity disorder 
which used to be called multiple personality disorder. And I would argue that what happened to this person I counseled may have happened to Britney Spears. And that's what some people think, but I just don't know for sure. But a number of these Disney uh, dancers could have, that also could have happened to. And, and the, but I, I show the evidence that that's, that could have happened to Courtney Love. She said in letters to her father that she was raped. I mean, she, you know, her therapist had sex with her. They gave her these psychohypnotic drugs that were MK Ultra drugs. So she was already like a prostitute. Uh, the evidence shows that by 14 or 15 years old, shipping for the Japanese mafia before she traveled for about six weeks with, with a CIA agent. So, yeah, there's, there's definitely uh, evidence around some of these Disney folks, yeah. John, uh, we're pretty much out of time, but my last question has to do with an artist known the world over. A two-part documentary by HBO just came out called Leaving Neverland and reignited the controversy surrounding this person, which is, of course, Michael Jackson. Did he pop up in your research at all? And do you have any thoughts on what happened with Michael? Well, I didn't write about Michael Jackson. And uh, people tell me, you know, some, a former Black Panther said, it was when Michael Jackson started wearing a black beret like the Panthers and uh, then started saying, uh, getting political in his final concert. He got very political um, to some of his final concerts and said something they don't care. You know, had that song, They Don't Care About Us, speaking about, you know, the authority, the uh, powers that be. Um, that They think that that's what got him targeted. But at the same time, I didn't research him. So maybe he, he was guilty of these things. I really don't know. Um, so I, I can't speak to that. I just don't know enough. I got gotcha. you. John, I mean, what can I say? These two hours flew by. And I will tell folks this, that we barely <laughs> scratched the surface of everything you cover on your documentary, which was based on your book. And people are able to uh, pick one or both to check out. Why don't you tell people one more time where they can do that? Sure. Um, so you can find out more about just the movie at drugsasweaponsmovie.com or about the books and the movies at uh, drugsasweapons.com. And uh, you can also find it on, you know, of course, Amazon, but also Barnes & Noble. And it's the film streaming at when, uh, Amazon Prime now, too, and other places. Very cool. And can people find you on social media? Are you on Facebook, Twitter? I'm on Facebook, but I'm not doing Twitter. I'm not doing Instagram or anything else. It takes up too much time. I'm not into it. Sorry. <laughs> I don't blame you. Blame <laughs> me. Thank you so much, John, for being with us tonight. Like I said, it's uh, it was such a treat to talk to you and talk about this stuff because for me, and I know for a lot of people as well, huh? it really puts things in, into context and it, a lot of things that didn't make sense before make sense when you see it through this lens. So I think that the work that you've done, the research is extremely thorough. All the information is very well backed up and I yes. urge people to check it out because it's, it's extremely informative and extremely enlightening. So uh, thank you so much for all your work and for being with us tonight. Thank you, Frank and Genevieve. It was yeah. good talking to you guys. And that was John Potash, author of this amazing book drugs as weapons against us the cia war on musicians and activists and uh as i said it's a book a uh, documentary and uh if you found this interesting definitely check out his website john potash john potash.com i'm sorry and check out the documentary as always i'm engineer frank on twitter west of the rockies on facebook don't forget to follow the show on twitter wtr radio subscribe on YouTube, hit the subscribe button. And uh, if you're uh, listening to this as a podcast on iTunes, leave us a review. Uh, let us know what you think. Uh, we're always interested to hear people's thoughts uh, and leave, leave us a comment. The website is WTRradio.com, Genevieve Uway on Twitter. And I want to send a big shout out to everybody that tuned in on the TuneIn app uh, through the independent.fm, the uh, Live Me app. And as I said, if you're catching this as a podcast, I hope you really enjoyed it. We're going to go out with a with a song that's quite appropriate for what we talked about tonight. And so Genevieve, you're going to uh, say bang. <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, I'm sure it will also count as that. But uh, Genevieve actually uh, uh, recommended I play this track to end the show, which is a track by Muse and is aptly called MK Ultra. 
Take care, guys. Be safe. God bless. Don't do anything too crazy. We want to see you back next week. See you then. Bye. West of the Rockies with Frank the Engineer on the Independent FM, Los Angeles.